for the Baltimore Ravens getting closer to needing to draft a first round edge. We talk about that and so much more. Come up next here on Locked On Ravens. You are Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire, here with you on the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for being here and making Locked on Ravens your first listen each and every day. We're free and available on all podcasting platforms. That includes in video form on YouTube and audio form wherever you get your show. So be sure to subscribe. Both video and audio form really does mean a lot to me. It's the same show, both audio and video, so you're not missing out on any content. We're five days a week, plus bonus episodes of Ravens news analysis updates and so much more. Today's episode of Locked on Ravens is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning fight of the bet. That's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. We're back here. It is April Fool's, so hopefully not too many pranks going on today. It actually was Easter Sunday yesterday, so hope everybody had a great Easter Sunday. We're going to be grinding through this episode today. We had two bonus episodes come out this weekend, one talking about the Ravens' edge position and who they could sign from outside the organization. We also talked a little bit about the NFL's rule changes. Now, if you didn't tune into Sunday's bonus episode, long story short here, if I don't sound as energetic today or as enthusiastic, it's because I I don't feel that way. I woke up this morning, and we're talking Sunday with a – 102 fever, right around 102 fever. And I'm using literally every last ounce of strength I have to record this show. I can barely talk otherwise. I've saved it all for right here, right now. So I said yesterday was the biggest challenge in my Locked on Ravens career. It was five years. This one might be the second, but just please bear with me if, uh, again, I'm not sounding as enthusiastic as I do. But let's have a great episode. Let's talk about, again, the edge position. I think that's where I want to go here. It's the talk of town right now in Baltimore. I mean, you see Jadavian Clowney go to the Carolina Panthers, a bunch of edge guys, quality edge guys already off of the board, go into different teams. So I think a lot of Ravens fans might be getting a little nervous. Now, I'm not panicking yet, and we'll talk about that a little bit throughout the week. But I'm going to kind of pose the question here today. If the Ravens are getting closer to needing to draft a first round edge, just based off of who was left in free agency, I think there is a case for it and a case against it, but you'll see which way I lean towards the end of the first segment. So let's talk about this. Baltimore has always been a best player available team. And obviously here on Mock Draft Monday, we talk about Mock Draft. So we're going to be talking about a Mock Draft today where there is an edge rusher taken in the first round. But again, Baltimore has been that best player available team forever. Now, does that mean they go and take a quarterback every year if that's the best fit? No. When you have Lamar Jackson, you obviously don't need to take a quarterback, but It goes to show like a Kyle Hamilton pick or Marlon Humphrey pick. There are plenty of examples, especially in the first round of the Ravens going best player available because you don't want to rob yourself of an elite talent and reach for somebody who was not as far up on your board because who knows that player could drop to you. Now, the edge rusher first round department this year, it's a little bit interesting. Dallas Turner, I think you have a couple other guys, but I think the one that everybody's kind of linking to the Ravens right now is Chop Robinson. He's a, well, he did test really, really well during the combine and Penn state local guy. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds for Baltimore where you get a local kid and an Afe Owe, that, that Penn state connection there. I, that might scare away some people to be honest, but to me, I think that this shouldn't be okay. We're hitting the panic button. If, if you're the Ravens right now, Kyle Van Noy is still available in free agency. And we talked about who's still available right now. I'll actually try to pull up the list as I'm talking right here. But to me, it's we're we're three weeks. It's three weeks to the day in the free agency right now. All right. Started three weeks ago. The legal tampering period did. Now, I understand. I get it. The, The list of guys who are still available, not super inspiring. I've come on this show recently and said it's not super inspiring. But to me, it is Calvin Neuer bust, essentially, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Now, some of the other guys who are available, 
You have Emmanuel Ogba, Carl Lawson, Randy Gregory, Tyus Bowser, Jerry Hughes, Justin Houston, Bud Dupree, Shaq Lawson, Marcus Golden, Anthony Barr, and Bruce Irvin. I mean, maybe you bring in like a, a Dupree, a Gregory. I mean, I was a big Ogba fan, but his tenure in Miami didn't really work out so well. I think a lot of people were almost anticipating that one of Clowney and Van Noy, it's almost like, and Rocco DeSangro talked about this on our Friday episode, it's almost like with the cornerback room, everybody expected one of Ronald Darby or Arthur Millette back. And I think a lot of people had circled Ronald Darby on that list and said, yeah, this is the guy I'm expecting. And Darby goes to Jacksonville on the first day of free agency and everyone starts to panic and, and being like, oh, oh man, well, what's this position going to look like? How, how are they going to recover from this? And then they bring back Arthur Millette. Now that doesn't mean they don't need a, another third corner. I think, again, their, their nickel position right now is really good, but same time, you know, you have Brandon Stevens, you have Marlon Humphrey, but some of the reasons that this defense was so good last year is because Darby was able to step up for Marlon Humphrey in the absence that he had to have due to his couple of injuries and he balled out. So it's kind of flipping that back to the edge position. I think a lot of people knew and maybe thought that it was going to be one of Clowney and Van Noy. But now that Clowney's off the table, I think it's making some people nervous about like, okay, well, if it's not Van Noy, then are the Ravens in a heap of trouble? And so if Van Noy does end up going somewhere else, and look, Clowney got a deal worth $10 million per season. The Ravens were never going to pay that type of money. I mean, they just, they couldn't, unfortunately. Would a guy like Van Noy demand less? And Clowney actually signed a deal. He had, I don't think he'd ever signed a free agent deal since he came in the league before training camp. He, he usually likes to sit that out. But hey, you know what? He gets offered $10 million per season. He says, hey, man, I'm signing on that dotted line for sure. So what does it look like for Van Noy? Is this a situation where maybe he waits until training camp? That, to me, unless there is an agreement, that puts Baltimore in a pretty tough spot. Because what if they're kind of anticipating, a, you know what, Van Noy... He's coming back. And then all of a sudden another team swoops in and that was kind of like your backup plan and it's training camp already. And more guys have gone off the board and, and it just, it makes it. So if there's not, remember like Rocky, I seen had some sort of an agreement. Alejandro Villanueva had some sort of an agreement. Well, again, those aren't necessarily super inspiring names. I would want something like that. If I were the Ravens just to kind of cover my bases, because again, if you go into the draft and you're like, okay, fine, it's Van Noy then you don't take a Chop Robinson when he's there or Dallas Turner falls. Dallas Turner's not falling, by the way. But if if, if an edge rusher falls to you at 30 and you don't take him because, oh, yeah, Kyle Van Noy is going to be in the equation, but then he's not, that, that's a little bit risky to me. So I don't think Baltimore right now is getting closer to needing to draft an edge in the first round. I mean, look, there are so many other different positions Baltimore does need. Offensive line, corner, wide receiver. Obviously, edge is part of that, too. Those are my big four needs. But at the end of the day, I think Baltimore is still in a fine position where they can go best player available and just see how the draft falls to them. Coming up in the second part of the show, we're going to be talking about a mock draft Monday, getting into what I put out on Twitter for mock draft Sunday. And spoiler, there is a duplicate edge rusher who we've talked about on the show already before. Stay tuned, playing to talk about on Lockdown Ravens. First, this show is brought to you by FanDuel. Sports calendar is loaded. FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action. Because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus specials with any money fight on the bet. That's $200 you can use to bet tourney, MLB, NBA, NHL, and so much more. Visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown to make your first bet a big win. My bracket, it's all butt busted. I have UConn winning, but essentially all my final four teams are out outside of that. So not a great year for the sports or NCAA tourney for me. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We're back, our second segment of Locked on Ravens. Kevin Ostriker still talking with you here on this Mock Draft Monday, powering through, but the show must go on, so I am here with you. Thank you so much for tuning in today on April Fool's Day, by the way, making Locked on Ravens your first listen each and every single day. Let's keep, let's keep going, though. Let's talk about what I had for Mock Draft Monday. Again, kind of keeping with the theme of edge rushers. I decided, and usually I don't like to do this because I want to see just as many and break down as many different prospects in the first round as I can, but none of these edge rushers were really falling to me. So Chop Robinson out of Penn State was my selection at pick number 30. Now, I don't hate this pick whatsoever, but I feel like some people are a little nervous about Chop Robinson. It's based off of a little bit of lack of production and 
there, there's a fine line that a lot of teams have to go through. Some teams favor it a bunch, other teams don't, but it is the combine. How much do you favor athletic testing? How much do you favor stats? How much do you favor what's on the film? How much do you favor pure numbers? It's, it is a balance. And for the Ravens, I think there is a little bit of both. I think Baltimore, for the most part, almost is, and this isn't for every single pick in the first round, but I feel like they want to go with some of those fallers, guys who you wouldn't expect to be there at 30. For example, Kyle Hamilton being there at 14, not expected. But for the Ravens, they like to go and figure out that athletic testing and, and take those picks in the middle to later rounds. And look, I don't blame Eric DaCosta and company for doing that. And again, not every first round pick is just a guy who didn't test well or this, that. I'm not trying to box in what Eric DaCosta does or what these prospects are. but a guy like Chop Robinson, you're hoping for elite from Nafe Owe. You're hoping from elite for, for David Ajabo, but you, you can't really put all the eggs in the David Ajabo basket. Can't really put every single egg in the Nafe Owe basket. I think, again, he showed some flashes, but I think for me, for a lot of other people too, that's kind of where it got a little bit dicey and, and has gotten a little bit dicey in terms of how young can you go. And it's, it's like we're having this conversation again with wide receiver, for example. How young can the Ravens go? And how little of a veteran help do you need there? We're going to find out how Baltimore's feeling probably by the time the draft is over. And part of that will probably do will it'll have to do with Kyle Van Noy, what that ends up looking like. But I'm, I'm fine with the Chop Robinson pick. It's not my favorite pick in the draft, but the potential is absolutely, absolutely sky high there. Then in the second round, I, I kind of went against what I've been saying on this show for a while. So I'm about to get a little spicy. I'm going Jalen Polk, wide receiver from Washington. Now, Polk has been a fast riser. I think he was slotted to be more of a third or fourth round selection when this draft process started, but he has really come on here and is now, I don't even think he would fall to 62, honestly, where he's kind of being put right now. It's kind of like the Xavier Leggett's and some of those guys, Ricky Persall, where I think all those guys could go in the, in the second round, but before Baltimore picks, but Polk is somebody, his body frame is what the Ravens need. They don't need those smaller, speedier, wide receivers. They need a guy who can go up there, catch contested balls, and I think that Polk can definitely do that. Then in the third round, and the reason, so the reason I said that I went against what I've been saying in the show is because I've been saying, well, there's no way Baltimore takes no offensive linemen in their first two picks. Well, Obviously, I went edge and wide receiver there, so went a bit against what I said, but I ended up going offensive line in the third round at 93, and that's Kiran Amagdaji. He's a guy that has the physical traits, again, that Baltimore wants. He's a big guy. He has some foot speed, but some of the foot movement is a little off, but he has the athleticism. He has the strength. He's somebody that isn't going to be your absolute plug-and-play day one right tackle, but he can certainly compete with the Daniel Fileles of the world for that job. and. I, I would expect him to maybe go in the second as well, depending on just how many offensive linemen, specifically offensive tackles, fly off the board here. Then at number 113, I took Kyrie Jackson, corner from Oregon. He is one of my favorites, and I have no idea how he keeps falling to the fourth round. I expect Jackson to go in the second, but again, I take whatever the mock draft simulator gives me, so no complaints over here. Super physical, someone that has good ball skills as well. Jackson would be a perfect plug and play third corner for this team. Then at 130, a double dip at edge here. Jax Hunt out of Houston Christian. This is somebody that almost could fill the Tyus Bowser role, a super athletic and could be a threat to them, not to opposing offenses, not just as a pass rusher, but dropping back into coverage. And we know that it was, you know, more so in the in the Don Mortendale era that those guys would drop back a ton, but it is very valuable to have that versatility. Them. Number 165, Javon Foster, offensive lineman from Missouri. Definitely a project player. I could see him going in the third or fourth round. So getting him at 165, again, is a steal for me there. Miles Harden, double dip in at corner. Corner from South Dakota there at 218. I think he could play both inside and outside really physical as well. And I think we've kind of seen Baltimore trying to change their defensive identity to more of a physical defense, specifically with what we saw from their additions and some tractions last year. Then 228, Kimani Vidal, the running back from Troy, is the pick at 228. He's a smaller back, but someone who is super explosive and 
could fill in that third running back role behind Derrick Henry and Justice Hill to keep Mitchell's ready to come back. So again, it's more of a seamless transition than drafting one of the top running backs. And that guy may be expecting to have a consistent role throughout the year. Then at 250, this is my guy. End of my drafts, I, I always take him. It's Jacob Monk, the guard from Duke. So I took three offensive linemen in this draft. He's super physical, someone that I would most definitely want on this Ravens team, 1,000%. So I thought this was fine. Again, you're taking swings on, on the athletic intangibles and also just figuring out ways to address both needs and best player available. So I was definitely fine with this one that I had right here. Coming up, though, on the final part of the show, we'll get into Mock Draft Mania from Twitter getting into some of the mock drafts that you put below mine. Stay tuned, plan to talk about on Locked on Ravens. First, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you'd do if you had an extra hour in your day? Would you go for a run? Would you take a nap, read a book, show up for a friend? A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, though, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze what special thing into your schedule is, is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. Therapy has so many different benefits too, such as learning positive coping skills, how to set boundaries, again, empower you to become the best version of yourself, and it isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma. It's for everyone. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give better help a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on. We're back. Our final segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Ostriker still talking with you here on this Monday. Again, hope everybody had a great Easter Sunday. That was yesterday. I spent all of it in bed, barely talking. Again, I woke up with a right about one or two, 102 fever this morning and can barely talk. It is, I'm very weak and everything, but got to power through because we are five days a week. I've never missed one episode of the show, including bonus content. And I promise we are an episode 1,000. 216 here today. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, also in audio form as well. We had you covered with Ravens news analysis updates and so much more. Now let's get into a couple of mock drafts that were on Twitter. Again, how I do this is I put my mock draft out on Sunday and then I'll put a tweet on the Locked on Ravens account. You can then respond to the Locked on Ravens tweet and just in the order I see them, I read them out. So Let's first get into one from SZGS Sports or SZG Sports. There we go. Who has the Ravens trading back and taking JC Latham, the tackle from Alabama, at number 33? Keon Coleman, wide receiver from Florida State at 62. Marshawn Nealon, edge from Western Michigan at 93. Naoma Pritchett, the corner from Auburn at 101. Kiran Amidaji, the offensive lineman from Yale at 113. And Brendan Rice, wide receiver from USC at 130. I think I like this one better than mine. Trading back and still landing J.C. Latham is ridiculous. I think he doesn't even make it out of the top 20 at the very, very maximum. Then getting Keon Coleman at 62, a guy that I expect to go late first, early second at the very max. I mean, that's that's incredible. And then Marshawn Neeland and then Pritchett. But then getting Kieran there at 113 and then Brendan Rice at 130. The first two picks and the last two picks – Oh, yeah, I, I, I am 100% on board with that. So essentially what I think happened here is, if I'm not mistaken, the trade was number 30 for 33 and 101. Maybe there was an extra pick or a late round pick in there, but I can only see uh, up until 130 on the mock draft. Then we have one here from TD Hunter, who has the Ravens taking Tyler Guyton to pick number 30 offensive lineman from Oklahoma. Xavier Leggett, wide receiver from South Carolina at 62. Dominic Booney, the offensive lineman from Kansas at 93. Kyrie Jackson, a corner from Oregon at 113. Javon Solomon, edge from Troy at 130. Tommy Eichenberg, linebacker from Ohio State at 165. Sion Vaki, the safety from Utah at 218. Carson Steele, running back from UCLA at 228. And Tylen Grable, offensive lineman from UCF at 250. I like the Guyton pick. I like the Leggett pick. Kyrie Jackson, that's my guy there. I mentioned that in the second part of the show. Javon Solomon, also very interesting. Insane production at Troy, but obviously, since it's not a Power 5 school, you got to wonder a bit about how much that production is going to translate into the NFL, which is, is just a, a much higher level of competition already. So that, to me, is an interesting one. But 
I, I like the three out of the first four. Maybe I would have taken an edge at 93 instead of 130, but I don't hate it. I don't hate double dipping at offensive line in the first three rounds to your first three picks there if you're the Ravens. So shout out to TD for this one. And then we're going to get into one here from Mame Son, who has the Ravens taking J.C. Latham, the offensive lineman from Auburn, at number 30. Cooper Beebe, the offensive lineman from Kansas State at 62. Chris Abrams Drain, the corner from Missouri at 93. Blake Corm, running back from Michigan at 113. Cam Hart, corner from Notre Dame at 135. Cornelius Johnson, wide receiver from Michigan at 168. DeAndre Prince, corner from Ole Miss at number 179. Miles Cole, edge from Texas Tech at 218. Nelson Caesar, edge from Houston at 239. And Nathaniel Watson, linebacker from Mississippi State at 250. I like these two picks too. I think BB could be a very much sleeper pick to go in the late first, early to mid second as well. So getting them a 62. And again, I talked about Latham and just how good of a player he is. And I don't expect him to fall anywhere near 30. Now I think the quorum pick, and this is one that a lot of people have talked about. I'm personally not taking a running back with my first three picks if I'm the Ravens, right? Once you hit 113, once you hit day three, I'm all for it. Some people love this Blake Quorum pick. Other people hate this Blake Quorum pick. I'm kind of in the middle. Again, if there's no one else on your board that you like and Quorum is somebody that, again, is a little older, has the wear and tear on the tires, but is a really quality player, again, it could be a move that Baltimore makes. So one corner here, or no, excuse me, two, Cam Hart and DeAndre Prince, but I do like this one overall. The first two offensive line, or no, there are three corners in this one, excuse me. So yeah, I think the first two offensive linemen are awesome. And then the needs kind of get filled out the rest of the way. Maybe one less corner, right? Maybe I'd go and uh, add a wide receiver earlier than 168. But in my opinion, this is a solid mock draft here. That's all I have here today on Locked on Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in. Coming up tomorrow, more Ravens content here. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube, follow along in audio form. I'll see you right back here tomorrow on Locked on Ravens.